From Microbe TV, this is Office Hours for Wednesday, January 24, 2024. Whoa! 12424. How about that? Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and welcome to the place on the internet where you can talk to scientists, ask them questions, chat with them, be chill. Where else can you do that? Nope, here it is, and it's me tonight. Some nights we have guests. We're going to have a guest next week. We had a guest the last week, Cindy Leifer. I bring in people that are interesting, and they're yours to talk to for an hour or two. I want to thank our moderators tonight. Tonight there's not going to be any echo because I don't have a guest, right? No echo. Tell me if there is. My moderators, my moderators, they're mine. Andrew from New Zealand, Steph SF, the SF denotes San Francisco. Tom Steinberg, who is today in Oregon Coast Range, Les is from California. And Vanity Nutrition is from the New York area. Thank you all for joining, for moderating tonight, making the mistake of trying to read chats while, while talking. And as you see, I got a haircut, yes, Saturday. Good. It's good. I have uh, my blue glasses here. I got my dark shirt. I've totally gone to dark shirts now. No shirt. Turtlenecks. Turtlenecks all the way down, folks. <laughs> it's uh, It's good. In this chilly weather, I don't know, maybe in the spring I'll wear some shirts, but for now I'm turtlenecks all the way down. Where are you from, folks? Type it in. I want to see before we I have a little mini lecture for you tonight, and then we'll take your questions. Type in what, where you are. Look at all these folks. So we know that, um, here we go, Joseph is from southern, rainy southern Ontario. By the way, here in the New York area. The weather is six degrees and drizzling. It's above freezing. Snow is almost gone. And, uh, you know, it's a dicey thing whether you wear a fuzzy hat or not. Anyway, Joseph is from uh, Ontario. Tom, as I said, is from the Oregon Coast Range. Rip Repeaticomp. Is from Taos, New Mexico, where I've been a number of times. John is from Minneapolis. Claire is from the UK. I like doing this, folks. Ab Abilash is from Frankfurt, Germany. Rima is from Iowa. Questella is from Ohio. Steph SF, of course, from San Francisco. Neva from Buda. Thank you for coming, Neva. Here is Mr. Doreen <laughs> from Elgin, Illinois. He's very funny. So Doreen, he's holding up Doreen's picture. That's Mr. Doreen. And, and I <laughs> met him in Chicago last year. And then the first stream, I said, I met Mr. Doreen. And so he made it, it made it his handle. I think that's cute, right? Kang is from Chicago, who I also met in Chicago. We had dinner. Me, Kang, Daniel, and Christina Naula. Simon is from the Bay Area. <clears throat> Christopher is from Montreal area in Canada. Pete is from... London and the south of England, MK, Eastern Massachusetts. Khan, interesting. Khan Het, Orlando, Florida. Patty is from the New Hampshire seacoast. Nicola is from Italy. And Lise is from rainy Columbus. You know, I got an invite to Columbus before ASV talk at some local group. I don't even know. I, I can't remember what it is. I, I'll let you know the details. It's a hard one because I think it's on a Thursday. Visto is from Sydney, Australia. 
Can I see the early messages before the start of trans? The first message I see is from Joseph, who says, Hello, everyone, from rainy southern Ontario. And that is not the first one. Mm, by far. It's, it's uh, where is it? What, what is it? Rainy southern Ontario. It's not the first one. I don't know what it is. Oh, yeah, it is. It's number... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's number seven. It's not too bad. And and Ruth is number two, actually. They're getting shuffled here. I don't know why. All right, back to the locations. We got Pete. We have Pete. Um, oh, Hans is from Ecuador. Jessica is in Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> Aereo Zone is from Asheville, North Carolina. Steph loves talking to scientists. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. On your opening page to this session, what are you holding? Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a model of polio virus spilling out its genome. And that is going to be part of the thumbnail for lecture number three, which I did today which is genomes and genetics. I wonder, I wonder if I could... Let me, let me see if I can show you the picture. Oh, it's actually in the thumbnail. You've seen the <laughs> thumbnail. It's right here. Here we go. <clears throat> there it is. It's poliovirus, and its genome is coming out. So let me explain. <clears throat> the, um, the genome of poliovirus is about 7,440 bases. And... Uh, a number of years ago, uh, Ann Palmenberg, a rhinovirologist, Picorna virologist at Wisconsin, who's been on TWIV a couple of times, she beaded for me the, the genome with beads, four different color beads on a wire, and she put them in the right order. And so that's what's coming out of the virus particle. It's very cool. <laughs> I'm going to have a different picture of me on every lecture this year. It was suggested that instead of having virus-related stuff to put me on. So I said, sure, I have no problem with putting photos of me on. Kathleen is in South Jersey. Razor, Saskatchewan, Canada. I almost went there this year, but I have a conflict with another trip. Doreen is in Hartford. Sam is in Ontario. Hmm. Uh, not really Steve Jobs. It's my own... Thing because I'm not wearing jeans. I'm wearing Dockers, you know, black, gray, green, blue. I have one for every day of the week. Black, gray, green, blue, and steel. It's like between gray and black. I have five pair, and I pair them up. And uh, this year when I'm lecturing... There's nowhere to clip the mics. So I wear a little jacket, a little sports jacket from Lululemon that has a thing that I can clip on. Not You didn't need to know any of that. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> and MN is near D.C. And look who is here tonight. Welcome, Dr. Amy Rosenfeld, the plaque assay princess. Where is the plaque assay princess picture? I, I don't even have it here. No, too bad. Oh, that's because this is a new computer, right? Well, not a new one, but I decided to... Con I had a streaming computer and an editing computer, and I just... Too much. So I do everything now on the editing computer. This is what I'm streaming on now. Cheryl is from Santa Rosa. <laughs> Robert is from Lafayette, Louisiana. G is from Detroit Metro, Michigan. Elizabeth is from West Virginia. Will is from Changsha, China, where it's snowing, and you've got an XBB vaccine like we do here. Hey, Amy, people are saying hello to you. I hope you realize that. See, Jessica's saying hello, and other people are. Jonathan's from Encinitas. Frank is from Santa Barbara. EHS is from Lehigh Valley. Maureen is from Northeast Ohio. Hmm. 
Good questions here. I'll, I'll answer them. Hey, MJ is from Central Texas. Look at this. Hey, Amy girl. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Vancouver, BC. Galveston, Texas. Basel, Switzerland. Is that how I should say it? Basel, right? Robert is from Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Uh, Angela from Twiv, ha ha. Uh, I don't think that's Angela Mingarelli. <laughs> Kip from San Francisco, hello Kip. Tom is from Utah. Eric is from Ohio. Elena is from Coxsackie, New York. I still have your mic, your microphone, uh, your microscope. Look, look at it. It's so solid. See? It's, this is 50 pounds. Uh, maybe 35, 40. This is really a vintage scope. And it's yours. I just need to get it to you. I'm so sorry. Well, you said you might be in New York. In which case, I'll bring it to the incubator. Let's see. Alvin is from north central Iowa. Lori's from Texas. You know, I don't see a lot of people. Oh, here we go. Frank is from Ireland. Brian's from Louisville. Bernard is in Rockville tonight. <laughs> the polio beaded genome. What colors are the bases? I don't know offhand. A red is A. I can tell you that. Do you know how I can tell that red is A, that I remember it? Because it's at the three prime end, there's a string of A's. And I also know that the first two bases are U. So if I could get the thing, I would have the color of U. <laughs> the color of U. And then the other two, I know the base next to U at the five prime end. So I could get, I could get all of them by deduction. How about that, folks? <laughs> eh, that's very cute. James is from Longmont, Colorado. <laughs> oh, Silvio Pina. Vincent is even more delightful in person. Thank you very much. So are you. <laughs> Everyone is more delightful in person. All of you who visit are lovely. It's a lot of fun. Carol is from California, our favorite nephrologist. Jeff is from Elgin, Illinois. <laughs> Moscow. Wow. What a name. Verenica. Is that your real name? That's a cool name, even if it's a handle. Uh, I like that very much. <laughs> it seems you have a capsule wardrobe. What is a capsule wardrobe? I don't know what that is. I Yeah, I have certain things I wear, and that's it. Even socks. You know, I, I have become a big fan of Bombas. Oh, my gosh, I love them. It's all I wear now, Bombas. I got like two weeks worth the great compression. I can wear them on the airplanes. I standing up lecturing. Oh, I like them. They're just, <laughs> they're just great. They feel good and they have nice, nice colors. <laughs> uh, Vincent, I got that Lululemon blazer thing last year. It's pretty cool. It's zip up. It's got a high collar and it's like some synthetic material. So it gives me a place to hang two microphones, right? Rafael is in Brazil. Barbara's in southern Ontario. Ariel is in Westchester. Isabel, Chicago. Yep, Basel. Because I don't know if you listen to TWIP, but the letter reader got it wrong. She said Basil. And I cringed, you know, to myself. Safi is from Albany, New York. <laughs> Ah, Kiberen, Kiberenigest. Wow. Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I don't remember anyone from Ethiopia before. Holy cow. Southeast Pennsylvania. Phoenix. Not in a hurry. <laughs> Elena, come to the incubator. Please. Anyone's welcome to visit. Just make sure I'm there. Okay? Because it's... Well, it's, more, it's fun when I'm there. I can show you, show you everything. 
Um, anyone else? Anyone else uh, from here? Piffle Prattle is from England. <laughs> yeah, you love Bombus, huh? They're very cool. Anything else? Uh, Patricio is from Ecuador. Cool. Um, uh, since we're on fashion, is the quality on quince worth it? Amy, I don't know what quince is. <laughs> I don't know what quince is. I feel like I'm off center here. There we go. That's better. Right? It was a little... I was, I was tilted. I didn't feel right. All right, let's go back. To, so so let's go back to the question. Oh, I want to do a mini lecture. So I've started my virology course, and it's on YouTube. Just your guys are on YouTube. You can find it. The first two lectures are up, and um, I'll be putting them up twice a week. It's like twenty-five lectures. Quince is a company name, and uh, they're they're really good. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about influenza, <laughs> so you know the name of the last twiv was I opened the pigsty and in flew Enza. You know, there's a child's poem. In flew Enza, child's poem. It had a little bird. Its name was Enza. I opened the window and in flew Enza. <laughs> Isn't that great? I told Dixon that many years ago, and he remembered it, and he used it to make the title. So we had two papers. We had one about influenza viruses going back and forth between pigs and humans, and we had another one about viruses making wings on insects, inducing them, infecting them, and making them have wings, long wings. So um, it was hard to combine them, so we ended up... That one was a good one. You know, I made a, I found a pig with wings for the, um, uh, for the, for the title of the show, for the thumbnail. Anyway, I want to talk a little bit about influenza. Okay, here we go. You can you can throw in your questions and I'll get to them, at some point. So this on every lecture in my course I have a quote, and this one is. <laughs> This is from the influenza lectures. You know something's happening, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? <laughs> it's an acute infection. Remember, we talked about this with polio. Rapid onset of viral reproduction, limited, not necessarily short, but possibly severe course of disease, production of large numbers of particles, and immune clearance. So here we go. Uh, on the x-axis is time. On the y-axis, we have Virus production in the line and disease in the red. So typical acute infection. And so influenza is an acute infection. <laughs> and here's the virus. I don't even need earplugs tonight, but I'm used to hearing myself because there's no one else talking. It's an enveloped virus. And there's a membrane in the membrane are embedded some viral proteins like hemagglutinin, HA, neuraminidase, NA. There's also an ion channel. Inside are the eight RNAs. They're complex with proteins, so they're called ribonucleoproteins, RNPs. And on the electron micrograph, these influenza viruses have a characteristic morphology. I can make this bigger. It doesn't have to be so small, right? In fact, would I have more space there? No, this is the beauty of <laughs> of live of of these programs, right? <laughs> this is a typical influenza electron micrograph. So you can see all the the spike proteins, HA, the NA, they're all lined up. They look like spikes. Now there are three types of influenza, A, B, and C. A and B cause similar disease, which we'll get to, and we vaccinate against them. Influenza C, we don't vaccinate against it. It causes mostly inapparent or mild, very mild upper tract illness, not worth vaccinating against. And only A influenza types cause pandemics. 
and a, a hallmark of influenza virus is antigenic variation, which we're going to talk about in a bit. Now, how is it transmitted? By droplets produced by coughing and sneezing and coughing. As you know, when you cough or you sneeze or you just talk, you're making droplets of all different sizes. You make big ones, you make intermediate size, you make tiny ones, and they can go different distances. And so that's how influenza viruses are transmitted, mostly in the large and small ones, less so in the infectious droplet nuclei, the ones that can travel a long way. You can also get it by contact with an infected individual or contact with a contaminated surface. You touch the subway pole, which hundreds of people have touched in the last hour, and then you touch your face and you've taken the virus from the pole and put it into your eye or your nose. Very common. So once the virus gets into your nose, it reproduces in the nasopharynx, the upper respiratory tract. Yeah, here's the nasopharynx up here that's got these turbinate baffles. They're lined with epithelial cells. And the virus reproduces in those, <clears throat> spreads extensively. You get the upper tract symptoms, and uh, then the virus can move down into the lungs and cause serious problems down there. It's often focused in the trachea. So most flu gets as far as the trachea, but the most severe cases you get pneumonia. And uncomplicated influenza, you have a one to five day incubation period. You have an abrupt onset. You can sort of tell when it started with your headache, your chills, your dry cough. You get high fevers, myalgias, malaise, anorexia. Fever peaks within a day and then begins to decline. Only lasts about six days. But as the fever declines, then you get more intense respiratory systems. You get productive cough, a lot of mucus. And this can, this can persist for one or two weeks or even longer. Cough and weakness. So how do you diagnose it? All right, so we're talking about influenza-like illness, ILI is the, is the moniker. Fever of at least 100 degrees, cough or sore throat, and no other known cause. You can take a rapid lab test. They're not great. That's the most common way that you're going to get diagnosed. It could also be done by PCR, by viral culture, by serology, but uh, those are going to be more costly, of, of course. All right, so, so here's the course of illness. This is done in volunteers. You can infect volunteers with certain strains of influenza viruses that are mild. And so here on the left, we've infected volunteers at day zero. And then we're looking at viral titers uh, from the nose, taking nasal swabs in black, dots, and then the symptom score is in open squares. What is the symptom score? You, you ask people on a scale of one to five. Do you have a headache? Do you have runny nose? Do you have congestion? Do you have sore throat, fever? Whatever, right? And you make a score. So you see, you have, at day one, you got quite a bit of viral shedding and pretty low score. And then the score, the symptom score begins to catch up and then surpasses. So maybe you have a day of uh, incubation period. It's not huge where you're shedding. And then begins to decline right away. A typical acute infection. Look at that. Symptoms in viral titers pretty much gone by day nine. And this is another experiment with volunteers also. Again, you challenge at day zero and you see virus titers here. And then we're looking at interferon, and we're looking at antibody in various places, nasal wash or serum. And you can see as the virus, by the time the virus goes down, look at this. There's barely any antibody. It's the interferon that's clearing the infection here. The antibody's for next time. And the febrile illness, again, is about six days. Kind of similar to this one here. So a typical acute infection. Now, what about in a population level. So influenza is a seasonal infection in temperate climates. All right? Temperate climate means you have a winter and a summer. 
And in the winter is when we see influenza. So here are four different influenza seasons, 2004, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, and 7, 8. And you're looking at different types of influenza, H3N2, H1N1, unsubtyped influenza B. And you can see here, start to go up around the end of the year, week 50, peaks around week 8 of the next year, and then goes down. It's totally, and then in the spring and summer, nada. Okay? And again, the next year, up, down, up, down. Some years, more cases. But that's the pattern. It is a seasonal illness. This is the way COVID will be eventually, I'm pretty sure. I'm guessing. So the overall burden, which is based on many years, well, this is 2010 to 2020. You can see we're looking at deaths at the top here, hospitalizations and illnesses. So the range of deaths is 12,000 to 61,000 a year in the U.S. Hospitalizations here and illnesses, up to 45 million uh, illnesses. And so you see this pyramid changes year to year, and the different segments change. Some years you have more deaths, some years you have fewer. So that's the story there. And here's influenza is extremely well tracked. A lot of data uh, sent in by laboratories all over the U.S. and all over the world, in fact. But these are U.S. data. First, you have the statewide if you go to cdc.gov slash flu slash weekly, you will see the statewide data on a weekly basis. So whether you have high or low activity, this is week 40 ending. This is from 2022-23 season uh, ending on October. So it's really before the peak. And then here on the top left, we have influenza positive tests reported to CDC by U.S. public health laboratories. This is 2019-2020, just to give you a sense. So here we have 2019 week 46, just the end of the year, starting to go up. You have a peak here in week 52. And it goes down a bit, then it goes back up again. And then it's trending down so that by week 12, 4, 8, 12, three months, January, February, March, end of March, there's no more. And here's where we are this year. So the uptick started, I can barely see this, week 46. <laughs> it's peaked week 50, 52, and then it goes down a bit. But it may go up again because, you know, this is just week two of the new year here. And so there's a lot more season to go. I mean, it could go up a bit, could go down. We'll see be interesting to see if it goes up like it did here in the 2019-20 season. All right, and one more thing, which is interesting, is to try and understand the severity of the disease. They track what's called excess mortality from pneumonia and influenza. So hard to distinguish the two. So there is a from year to year, and these are <clears throat> these are very these are weeks for different years, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. Here's your, your peak during the winter of pneumonia and influenza mortality. So they combine the two. And then in the red is the actual data. And you can see most of the time the mortality parallels what you would expect. In some years it's very high. You can see like here high excess mortality. Other years it's not. And... Um, that the, all these things are tracked. Now, this one came out, this view came out uh, during COVID. Now, this is a similar sort of graph where we're having with weak in different years, epidemic threshold of, here we have uh, influenza, pneumonia, influenza, and COVID, pick. <laughs> and that's the red, so it's combined. And the blue is just COVID, and the um, the the influenza is in yellow here. So it's compressed because the COVID is so high, right? When you see 2020, 21, very little uh, influenza activity. But basically, COVID is pushing the epidemic threshold of pneumonia over, up, like flu does typically in, uh, in, in years before there was COVID. Uh, one more statistic is tracked. This is the percentage of outpatient visits for respiratory illness, which are presumed to be influenza, influenza-like illness. It's I-L-I net. <laughs> and again, this is uh, weeks. Um, 
and these are these are different seasons. So these are different weeks from week forty through the end of the year, the beginning of the next year, into week thirty eight. And so here, for example, the twenty twenty two twenty three season is peaked at week forty eight. But you see, in some other years, it peaks later, like week six. And sometimes there are multiple peaks, like this green one, which is 2019, 2020, had three peaks. And the blue one is 2018, 19. It was later also, and also percent of visions was, was lower. So this is another way of capturing data. It monitors visits for ILI, which is fever and cough or sore throat, as I showed, told you on that slide. It's not laboratory confirmed, so there may be other respiratory pathogens in here as well. Okay, complications. You can get pneumonia where the virus goes down into the alveoli and causes damage. That's bad. You can get secondary bacterial pneumonia, recovering from flu, and then suddenly the bacteria move in. You can get generalized muscle pain, heart involvement because you're having problems breathing, and then Rye syndrome. Encephalopathy and liver damage can be seen after influenza. So we vaccinate against influenza because it's a serious pathogen. You have a lot of deaths. And the main vaccine for many years was grown in chicken eggs, embryonated chicken eggs. It was then inactivated with formalin and injected into the muscle, the deltoid muscle. Every year we make about 75 to 100 million doses. It's about 60% effective in preventing severe disease in in children and adults less than 65 years of age. And that protection seems to correlate with antibodies to HA and NA. There are now, of course, other vaccines, including those uh, produced in cell culture. Now, the problem <clears throat> with influenza vaccines is that uh, every year the envelope proteins of the virus change. So you have to select new vaccine strains in the first few months for the Northern Hemisphere for a manufacturer. And what they do is they take a strain that grows really well in eggs or cell culture. This is called a high-yielding strain. And then they co-infect cells with whatever strain they want in the vaccine, and they select for high-yielding reassortants with the HA and the NA from uh, the currently circulating strain. So here is the 2022-23 egg vaccine. All right, this is last year's. It had two A components, an H1N1 and an H3N2. Both of those are circulating. It had two B components, a Victoria lineage and a Yamagata lineage, so it was quadrivalent. They didn't see much Yamagata. <laughs> they did not see much Yamagata. Um, so they took it out of the vaccine for this year. And you may remember we said here on Twitter, I don't think it's a good idea. I think they should look a little longer. Well, guess what? Yamagata's back. They said, oh, it's gone. The experts said it was gone. I should have waited another season because it's back. So making the vaccine is tough because you need to do it, select your strains in the early two months of the year. So there's global surveillance, global influenza surveillance network of many, many laboratories gets isolates and, and characterizes them. So you select strains in January and February, and then you spend many months making the vaccine and then um, licensing it and, and packaging it. And you start vaccinating in September. And of course, in those intervening months, you, you might be proven wrong. The problem, of course, with the vaccines is that there's antigenic drift. So the hemagglutinin, which is one of the main two targets for neutralizing antibodies, uh, sustains amino acid changes every year. And these are parts of the hemagglutinin that vary in color here. And it just takes one amino acid change to reduce the efficacy of the vaccine. So some years they get it and some years they don't. Obviously, we need a better solution. And people are looking at these conserved epitopes on the stem that don't change as potential vaccines. The other issue, of course, with influenza is reassortment. As I told you earlier, and viruses with a segmented genome can co-infect the cell and outcome reassortants, and that has generated pandemic viruses over the decades. So here in 1918, we had our 
big pandemic outbreak. This was a virus that probably came from a bird. It was an H1N1 with little human adaptation. It probably evolved in the bird and just by chance that one strain was just right and it got into humans and boom. And that virus circulated until 1957 when a new pandemic virus emerged, the H2N2, that had you know, some genes from the 1918, but three new ones from, an, from a, uh, a virus from ducks, probably, or aquatic birds. And these include two new HA and NA genes. So now it's nobody's immune to this virus. Right? They're, they're all immune to H1N1. H2N2 comes along, boom, you have a pandemic. 1968, same thing. We swap out uh, the HA only from an avian virus, and this causes another pandemic because nobody is immune to H3. And then in 2009, we have another H1N1 pandemic, which is formed by reassortment of influenza viruses from Eurasian swine, from North American swine, from classic swine H1N1, from human H13N2, and from avian viruses. So all the different colored segments there. This thing was in the making in nature for many years. And the, this H1N1 and this H3N2 are still circulating uh, every year. Okay, so that's one of the problems with vaccination. And finally, we do have antivirals uh, against influenza. We have Tamiflu and Relenza, and r Romantidine is no longer used because the viruses are all resistant. Um, Tamiflu is, is taken orally. Relenza is inhaled. So there's Tamiflu. Relenza can be inhaled. And then we have Zofluza, which is an inhibitor of the one of the virus enzymes. And it's very effective, but hardly anyone uses it for reasons that are not clear. And that is your mini lecture on influenza in fluenza. So let me go down now and take some of these questions. Um, personal update from John up to TWIP 66 and three lectures from Brianne. So Cynthia reminded us that Brianne's immunology lectures are on YouTube. So you can learn immunology too. That's very cool. <clears throat> Kang wants to know if there's an optimal time for viruses to be released during the infectious cycle with the lowest particle to PFU ratio. Oh, it is Angela. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> it's a weird that's a weird handle. Okay. That was Angela Mingarelli from Twiv. Ha ha ha. I should have known because in her text she always goes ha 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 ha. Ha ha ha. <laughs> hey, welcome Angela. I don't know of this, there being an optimal time to get a good particle to PFU ratio, right? Um, I mean, you could speculate, right? But I, I would, because early on, um, maybe there, there's a higher proportion of defective particles. I don't know why that would be. So no, I don't know of an optimal time for particle to PFU ratio. It would be you could do that experiment, right? You could do a time course and harvest. Say you have a virus that is finished reproducing in eight hours, like polio. You could take hourly time points and measure the particle to PFU at each time point. It would be interesting. I'm not aware of it. Oh, so Pete <laughs> corrects me. In lecture tw one, remember, I have that algal bloom. It's uh, Emiliania huxleyi is the, uh, is the protist. It's Cornwall on the southwest tip of England, not Greece or Italy. Okay, <laughs> my, my, my bad. <laughs> I guess it kind of does look like England, right? Or I have to remember that. Cornwall on the southwest tip of England for next year. <laughs> Thank you very much. We talked about the opening page. <clears throat> F 
Frank has a fact check. I've heard that due to vaccinations and previous infections, immune systems are more sensitive to COVID and respond at a lower viral load, uh, leading to more false negatives. No, I don't think that's correct. I think you need to get to a certain... You can Look, the, the memory is going to kick in, assuming that you're months out and you have low antibody titers and T-cell levels. It's going to take a couple of days for the memory cells to kick in, and with time, there's going to be a good amount of virus reproduction. So I, I don't think that's right. And I don't see the... I don't know the data that supports that. Yep. <clears throat> You had a famous time lapse of a monolayer plaque assay in the lectures. What virus was it? So that was Vaccinia virus, uh, which is, you know, Poxviridae. It's the one that Rich Condit worked on for many years. And Greg in, in Cambridge, what's his name? <laughs> uh, Greg, because this is going to do it. Greg Cambridge, or maybe Oxford, I don't know. Oxford... Pox virus. Greg, Craig, Greg. Hey, oh, yeah, I got it. First hit. <laughs> Jeff Smith, not Craig or Greg. <laughs> but that combination of Google search terms hit it. A paper of his. Jeff Smith. Greg. And I used the wrong, wrong word. I used Greg, but I did Oxford and Pox virus, and that got it. Jeff Smith took that time lapse movie. Yeah, many years ago. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. If you haven't seen it, if you don't want to watch the whole lecture, fine. Just go find the movie. It's very cool. <laughs> it's beautiful. Or back to Frank. Does a viral infection of a unicellular organism, like an amoeba, always cause the death? Hmm. I don't know exactly, but I would suspect not. Especially if there is a mm, a virophage or a satellite inside of that that protist, that amoeba, uh, which will protect the population. Actually, maybe not the initially infected cell, but the population could be protected. So, uh, but you know, I, I saying always cause death is a is a ringing a bell there because I I tell my students if you have a question and it says always it's probably wrong because nothing is always. <laughs> so, I think that they do survive. Yes, for various reasons. Yeah, there we go, Angela from Twiv. Ha ha ha, ha ha, ha ha ha. I don't, you know. It's interesting. You have ha, and then you have two H's. Ha, ha. Is that because it's like drawn out? I'm over analyzing this, I know. Angela Ness 11. Where's that from? <laughs> Angela Ness? <laughs> or is that like Angela Ness's? Like Nessens? Okay, forget it. I have a question. Could you explain why getting infected with measles erases immune memory? And we had this question uh, for Cindy last week. The virus infects the memory B cells, destroys them, right? So there are no more memory B cells. So yeah, it will come. they will come back, but you need exposure. You need vaccination or exposure to the virus. But then, yes, you can recover that memory. But of course, in the meantime, you're susceptible to infection, so it's not good. And how many kids, you know, after getting measles in the old days anyway... Now there are some that still get it, eight, nine in Philadelphia, right? Um, how many of them knew that their immune memory was going to be erased? None of them. They didn't get revaccinated. So it would be very interesting to study the morbidity in a, in a population who got measles. And afterwards, what diseases did they get compared to a vaccinated population that didn't get measles? That would be quite interesting, right? Hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
Yeah, satellite view. We got that. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, and so it, you probably saw this, Amy, but G got new cashmere hat, scarf, and gloves on sale. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Steph bought seven crew neck black sweaters. It's my winter uniform. So what, what are they made of? Are they cashmere? Should be, right? Or wool or cotton. Let me know. I'm curious. Hmm. In a capillary flow antigen test, will the control line always darken without fail? No. If it doesn't, you throw it out, right? Because something's wrong. So so th the question is, if, if you have a negative for the antigen that you're looking for, say COVID, SARS-CoV-2 antigen, if it's negative and the control line is negative, then the, the test is useless. It doesn't mean anything. If the control line is positive and the antigen is negative, then, of course... Um, <clears throat> what did I just say? I got distracted by a text from Daniel. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, if the test line is negative and the control line is negative, you throw it out. If the test line, if the control line is positive, then you can rely on whatever is happening there. The real question is if it, if the test is positive, the, the antigen, the viral antigen, and the control line is negative, what do you do? Actually, I would throw it out because I want the control to work. Because if that's screwed up, then who knows what's happening to the antigen test. So you redo it. So um, that's what, that's my interpretation of those lines. <laughs> and if you want a an explanation of it, you can go to the lecture number, what, number two, where I go through it. <laughs> Please let me know about your invite to speak uh, in Columbus. Yeah, I have to look it up. I forgot. And, uh, you know, it's, it's also, because um, I'm teaching, it's kind of difficult to squeeze that in. It is... Hmm... Ohio State. Ohio State, uh, this the Department of Animal Sciences, so I don't actually know where that is. Yeah. It's in April. I, oh, it's in the Columbus campus, Ohio State Columbus, April 23rd. Well, that's That would be the the date, and the problem is that April 23rd is February, March, April is a Tuesday. Ah, yeah, there you go. That's the problem. And I teach on Monday and Wednesday, so that's tough. You know, I could I'd have to get a flight Monday night and then fly back Tuesday night. So it depends on whether they're night flights because I teach until 5.30. It would take me a bit to get to the airport, you know. It'd have to be like an 8, 9 p.m. flight. I don't know if that happens to uh, Columbus. I'll look into it and let you know. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, hit the likes. So what do we have? Oh, we have 208 people. 146 likes. It's not a bad ratio, but hit the like if you haven't, just to attract more people here. I don't do as well as uh, Daniel or any guest. You know, that you guys like to have guests, I understand. So I'm trying my best. <laughs> Since there is a microbiome, is there something similar with viruses? Absolutely. There's a virome. Everything has a virome. The earth has a virome. The oceans are full of different viruses. We have a virome that occurs in different places, our skin, our respiratory tracts, our guts, our eyes, our brains even. It's in dirt. There's viromes in dirt. Yeah. It's harder to study because with a microbiome, you can identify bacteria by doing a small amount of sequence, ribosomal RNA sequence. But with viruses, there's no ribosomal RNA, so you have to sequence the whole genome, so it's a bit harder. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, let's see if I can answer this. I'm not sure. Kane says, my granddaughter is six months. I'm completely vaccinated. At this age, six months, loses antibodies from mom, but still nursing. That's good. Should mom, dad, 15-year-old sister join me? Absolutely. Yep, they should. And Robert is asking a question about, you know, ALL, a kind of leukemia. What are the main challenges in progress to curing leukemia? Well, you know, I'm not an oncologist, so I'm not going to be good at answering this. But um, you know, getting something that is specific to killing leukemic cells and not harming other cells and avoiding resistance are challenges. And you know, a lot of progress has been made. But, uh, and, you know, CAR T-cell therapies and monoclonals and so forth are great. So, but we're not there yet. We're doing better than we used to. That's all I can see. Say. <laughs> all right, two questions. If a cell is, or anyway, Amy, if you want to chime in, because uh, uh, Amy has some experience with that as well in terms of... Uh, reading about it. Um, Hans says, if a cell is already infected by SARS-CoV-2, can it be reinfected by the same virions being released? Hmm. What an interesting question. <laughs> you know, so in general, we don't think this happens, right? Because virus particle release is a relatively late stage of infection. And I think for most virus infections, the cell is pretty much trashed by that time. And even if virus, new viruses could get in, I doubt they would get very far. Uh, some virus-infected cells actually put up cell surface defenses. So a student asked me this after a lecture today, you know, how do viruses claim the cell as their own and prevent other viruses from getting in? Well, they don't always. They're often co-infections, but some viruses have strategies. They don't have strategies. Some viruses are able to prevent the same virus from infecting them. So retroviruses have ways of putting viral proteins on the surface that will block receptors and prevent and more, more of the same virus from entering. So there are some strategies to do that. I think it's not been studied for many viruses, but there have been some identified, which suggests to me that there are other specific ways. So two things. The cell's pretty sick, so it doesn't matter. And there are specific ways of uh, preventing reinfection. Nearest neighbor analysis for base identification. That's exactly the way they figured out the genetic code, right? <laughs> First trinucleotide made was poly U, phenylalanine. And they made all the poly A and poly C and G, and then they started making mixtures. Yeah, one, one at a time, nearest neighbor. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Oh, okay, so the, the, uh, the wardrobe that MN said I had, which was, now I've forgotten, capsule wardrobe is a wardrobe, it's a limited wardrobe with colors that you can mix and match. Ah, oh, it's interesting. Very, I have a, damn it, I'm going to write it down because I've already forgot. A capsule wardrobe. Let me write it down on my sticky capsule. Of course, I picked the pen that doesn't write. Capsule wardrobe. You know about that, Amy? Capsule wardrobe. I knew a guy at MIT when I was a postdoc. He had two pairs of pants hanging in his closet because they were $1,500 each and he couldn't afford more. Yoshi Yamamoto pants. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. 
So let's get back to some questions. So that was number one from from him. Capsule wardrobe. <laughs> Obama and Oliver Sacks had notoriously had limited wardrobes. So they looked like they wore the same thing every day, right? Some people find something they like. Oh, actually, you can't tell, but all these turtlenecks are slightly different. They're different brands. They have different necks. They have different materials. I just bought a bunch of different. Now, that some of them I like better than others, but I'm not going to go and buy more of that. It's not worth it. And they'll wear out at some point. Are there any viruses that use non-standard bases? And could we detect them with current tech? You know, I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. Do you know Amy or Angela? Some viruses swap in a fifth modified base. <laughs> Dozens of viruses seem to use a different DNA base. Hmm. So normal DNA has adenine, and then there's some viruses use diaminopurine instead, which has uh, an extra amine group. And then there's, of course, ZDNA, which is just a different structure, a different curve on the handedness. But they, DNA with diaminopurine is ZDNA. Yeah. So the so the answer is yes. Could we detect them with current tech? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if you could do that with with that single base. Yeah. Good question. Hmm. Oh, this is good. Very Nika is Veronica. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I gotta write this down too. I love this stuff. Very neat. It's a good. It's a good handle, right? Veronica equals very Nika. You could take almost any name and break it up like that, right? We're supposed to have an updated Sputnik vaccine, so very Nika is in Russia. But it was issued in such small numbers that maybe only med workers will be able to get it. No, it's not optimal. <laughs> great, great, great. Hmm. Uh, Abilash heads therapeutic virus development at Berngel Ingelheim and in developing oncolytic viruses Looking forward to your therapeutic viruses lecture on this year's lecture. Yeah, I have to really update it. You know, I'm behind. It's it's a little bit out of date. So if if you've uh, if you have some good review articles for me, that would be very nice. It's uh, Vincent at microbe dot tv. Don't I have a a thingy? Let me put it here. Vincent. At that's me, too big. Let's let's make it smaller. Edit the text. It's forty-eight point. Let's make it thirty-six. There we go. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> that poem is creepy. AF. Hey, no cursing on this show. I love it, but it's so creepy. I guess it's a little creepy. <laughs> All right. Uh, there are old films with children singing that influenza rhyme. Well, this is interesting from Rona from Basel. It wasn't the cough that carried him off. It was the coffin they carried him off in. Wow. She is following my lectures. Angela seems to be more relaxed and more talkative. She's awesome. Yeah, well, just getting used to it now, right? L losing the nerves. Yeah, she's talking a lot more. It's really good. Winston Churchill wrote a poem about influenza. Huh. 
Let's look it up. The Influenza Poem by Winston Churchill. Apparently, is the only poem he wrote in his life. It's very long. <laughs> I'm going to paste it into the show notes for you. Here we go. There you go. You can look at it. The first verse is, Oh, how shall I its deaths recount or measure the untold amount of ills that it has done from China's bright celestial land into Arabia's thirsty sand it journeyed with the sun. Uh, not my cup of tea, folks. <laughs> nope. <laughs> but that's cool. Oh, what's the most entertaining thing you can do with a centrifuge? Not the centrifuge, but the centrifuge rotors. Okay? Especially ultra centrifuge rotors in the old days they used to be made of aluminum. So after so many RPMs, <coughs> revolutions per minute, you couldn't use them anymore because they might blow up. So the um, reps would come around and paint on it in white letters, out of service. We're not supposed to use it. And so, I, I don't know how, because if you blew up your centrifuge, they're not going to pay for it, basically, if you use an out-of-service, an out-of-warranty rotor. So we used to take the rotors. So I was at Mount Sinai at the time, which is right next to Central Park. And we would bring them to Central Park and have rotor chucking contests. Yep. You heard it here first, <laughs> like a shot put, right? These things are heavy. The little ones are even heavy. So we would see who could throw them the farthest, and they'd make big divots in the grass, which I'm sure the New York Park Service loved. <laughs> oh, that brings back memories, M. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> uh, what's the function of the ion channels? Aha. They have a very important function. So the M ion channel, as the virus is being taken up into the endosome, so the virus binds the cell surface receptor, it gets taken up into the endosome. As the endosome moves from the plasma membrane towards the nucleus, the pH of the endosome drops. It's normal physiological process that happens even in, in an uninfected cell. The pH drop is mediated by a pump in the membrane of the endosome that pumps protons into the endosome interior. And you add protons, you lower the pH, right? The same protons that get pumped in pass through the M ion channel. It's, it's not an active channel. It just is an opening, and it lets them through. They get into the interior of the virus particle. And there, when the, when the flu virus membrane fuses with the endosome, that lower pH in the virus particle lets all of the RNAs come out. Otherwise, they remain stuck inside the virus particle. Okay? So that's the function and of the M protein ion channel. And we have a drug that plugs the channel. Amantadine or rimantadine plugs the channel so that the protons can't get into the virus. And so when <clears throat> the membranes fuse, the RNAs can't get out. So that blocks infectivity. Unfortunately, most Circulating influenza viruses are resistant to romantidine, so we don't use it any longer. It was the first flu antiviral developed. M says, how and why would a virus go dormant? Mm. Many viruses go dormant. Herpes viruses, for example. Why? Why would they do that? Mm. Just think. You infect a host, and then your genome goes into a cell and it becomes silent. It doesn't make any protein, so it's not visible by the immune system. And then periodically, the virus reverses its dormancy and makes virus particles and can infect a new host. So that's what the herpes viruses do. They go dormant, 
and then periodically they reactivate and make new viruses and pass them on to a new host. It's a very good strategy for ensuring your spread in the population, right? So that's the purpose of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Vincent, have you heard? Cute little icon there. <laughs> well, your name is very hard to pronounce. <laughs> I guess you're doing it on purpose. Foam 3 are reusable foam filter technology at a Bath University. This headline, Foam 3 are tech, Bath zero waste air purifier removes over 99% of viruses. Okay, so this is a big problem. Over 99% of viruses. So, you know, it doesn't take much to remove 99%, but the 1% is a lot of viruses, right? So it doesn't mean a lot to me. And also, what viruses does it remove? All viruses? Nah, you didn't test all viruses. One virus, a phage that you could plaque easily? Uh, not, not impressive. Let's type it in. Foam... 3R. <laughs> it doesn't like that. It wants me to search for something else. New air purifier. This is the University of Bath press release. Promises virus stopping performance and zero waste. So Somali Pereira has developed the foam 3R foam in a new air purifier design. All right, so I'd have to look at the literature there. I haven't seen that in the literature. I haven't seen the papers that report that. So I, I, I expressed my initial skepticism. I'd have to look to see more. Is there anything Vistotuti says to the meme that hot air, dry, dry out hot air melts fluvirions? I think it desiccates them, right? It removes the water. And so they probably break up. I'm not sure melt is the right term. They just lose infectivity because the membrane is no longer fluid and it can't fuse with the host cell. Hmm. Ah, here's a question about Paxlovid. At people who are at risk for severe influenza, whatever the reason, that's the latest, right? Who? Because Daniel talked about this last week. Anyone 12 and older who has mild to moderate disease and is at high risk for severe disease. That's EUA, actually. Let's see. Let's try with license in the in this search. But anyway, that's what I remember from Daniel. Can someone without comorbs? Yeah, sure. I see. I see a lot of people without comorbs getting Paxlovid. It's all up to your physician to prescribe it. So you, so you, you don't have to follow that. Why is influenza C not as pathogenic? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> Sounds like Eeyore. No, it's a good question. Um, there are many possibilities. You know, its gene products may interact differently with host cells. It may be, may be not very good at antagonizing immune defenses. Lots of possibilities. I'm not aware of any answer to that question. As influenza virus moves through the GI system, does it survive and cause GI issues? Or are there other viruses that are GI specific? Okay, so what happens is you have influenza in your upper tract and goes down into your lung. You're always swallowing virus particles. So the particles in your nasopharynx you swallow, the ones that go down your trachea, there is a beating series of cilia in your epithelium that move the virus back up and you swallow it. That passes through your stomach, which trashes it, its infectivity. And then it passes through you. 
broken viruses pass through you and come out in your poop. They're not infectious. They don't reproduce in the gut. Okay, so they're there because you swallow them as part of a defense against the virus. So they don't cause GI issues. If you do have GI symptoms when you have flu, it is because of the cytokines that you are producing in the lungs, which diffuse out and go everywhere. And you can have malaise, you can have headache, you can have muscle aches, you can have GI issues from those cytokines. Now, are there other viruses that are GI specific? Absolutely. We have the many enteroviruses like poliovirus that reproduce in the gut and often without symptoms. They can spread elsewhere and cause problems there. But they don't cause gut symptoms. Then, of course, there are viruses that trash your GI tract. Rotavirus, norovirus, astrovirus, they reproduce in the intestines. They mess it up in a variety of ways. They cause fluid imbalance. So you have diarrhea. You're throwing up. You're vomiting. It's a two-bucket disease. And those are specifically reproducing in the GI tract. Now, just think of this scenario. You have this incredibly sophisticated poliovirus, which barely causes any symptoms. Now and then, yeah, it paralyzes one in 100 or one in 200. It's an accident. Most of the time, it's replicating like gangbusters in your intestine. You're shedding it and spreading it to others, and you don't even notice. You don't have any gastroenteritis. And then we have neurovirus, which makes you vomit and throw up like gangbusters just to spread to other people. Now, you tell me who, which is the more sophisticated virus. I mean, there's, it's clear. It's very clear, right? How does influenza get on surfaces, there's probably some exhale business going on, but I think most of it is people are always touching their noses, when they, especially when they're sick. They get mucus on their fingers. They touch the subway pole, the door handle, whatever object you can think of, and the virus remains there in mucus. That's the key. And, you know, for maybe eight hours, it's infectious. So someone else can pick it up and then they touch their nose. A number of years ago, a study was done in Switzerland. And it was done there because it was a study of virus infectivity on banknotes. And where else, what better place to study banknotes than in Switzerland? <laughs> they have a lot of banknotes, right? So they took Swiss banknotes, Swiss franc, and pipetted virus onto them and asked, how long does it retain infectivity? And it was much longer when they mixed the virus with mucus. So it preserves infectivity. And that's what's going on, the banknotes, right? You, you rub your nose, and then you pull a note, a banknote out of your wallet, and you give it to someone with virus on it, the ultimate gift. You can make a joke out of that, right? <laughs> Speaking of influenza, do you know what happened to flu when it joined Instagram became an influenza. Mm. I'll keep my day job. It's okay. <laughs> well, uh, here, what does anorexia mean in terms of flu symptoms? Well, anorexia is a fear of, uh, of gaining weight, right? I don't know what that has to do with influenza. You think that maybe flu can cause anorexia? Let's see. Can, can flu cause anorexia? I don't see any hits for that. I mean, you can lose weight if you have influenza, but you may lose your appetite, right, for some time, or you lose your sense of taste and you don't want to eat. But I don't know about uh, influenza, uh, anorexia, no. Hmm. Okie dokie. <laughs> uh, I guess you're referring to the map 
of uh, influenza activity state by state, and Texas was very high. Um, well, that can be that this, that's where the outbreaks are occurring first. They don't have to be the same in all populations. And eventually all the other states ca catch up and become red and maybe reporting, as you say, as well. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> A professor told me, told us, that the cough that persists after a viral infection is due in part to the irritation of the dead epithelial cells in the lining of the airways. My understanding is that yeah, it can be that. It can also be cytokines triggering cough reflex. The T cells do cause damage throughout the tract. They do kill cells. So it can be virus damage or it can be T cell damage. In particular, you have a substernal pain in influenza. It's a characteristic pain, substernal, right? Your trachea is right underneath your sternum, and that can persist for several weeks, and that's caused by T-cell uh, damage mainly to the epithelium. Do I have a 5- or 10-year graph? I don't, but you could... You could probably they have the data at CDC. And you could probably make one, but the ones that they have available for download are just a couple of years. Yeah. Do we know why some years there are more flu cases than others? Okay, he'll take that first. No, <laughs> I think. I think it has to do largely with population immunity that um, in years where s antigenically similar viruses are circulating, so some years the antigenic change isn't substantial to disrupt immunity. And so you can imagine that you would, in subsequent years, you would have fewer cases as a consequence of that. Um, it can also be related to human activity, which can vary, right? There can be events in some years that aren't in others and so forth. Of course, the timing of the peaking. I think this is also driven by population immunity. As you get lots of people infected, their immunity rises. So a greater fraction of the population it becomes immune, and there are fewer hosts, and that's going to limit new infections. And so you saturate the available hosts, and the number of infections go down. And then you leave the, the winter season and other factors come into play like temperature and humidity. Now, there are influenza infections throughout the spring and summer. They're just very low and we don't look for them very much. But they're there. They're just very low in numbers. And of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, which is then their winter, they have lots of cases there. Hello, Frank, another of our moderators. How come Plum Island is the only place where hand, foot, and mouth? No, it's just foot and mouth. Hand, foot, and mouth is a Coxsackie virus. So foot and mouth disease is an aphthovirus, which is you cannot work with in the U.S. Why? Because we don't want the chicken industry to get destroyed by foot and mouth disease or the cattle industry, not chicken. Um. It's a very it's a bad virus to have around, and so we don't want it. And so, uh, research is limited to this basically a BSL three or BSL three facility, which, as my understanding, is moving to Kansas. <laughs> but that's the reason because it's bad for bad for cattle. Hmm. Is influenza virus sufficient to packaging eight segments? It's very good, yeah. Um, I think the particle, the PFU, is about 400 to 1, which sounds terrible, but it's not bad. So it gets it right most of the time, or a lot often enough, and there are specific mechanisms to ensure that the right RNA goes 
the right eight RNAs go into the particle. Yeah, then we're going to talk about that in the, uh, the virology course, in fact. What human receptor does flu exploit to get into cells? So there, it, influenza viruses bind to sialic acid. It's a sugar, six-carbon ring, which is the last sugar on a chain of sugars attached to a protein. So many proteins have sugars. They're attached to them. They're called glycoproteins. And sialic acid is one of many different sugars. It could be glucose, others, right? Fucose. Um, sialic acid is the last one, and that's the that's the receptor for influenza viruses. The HA binds to the sialic acid. Now, as you might guess, sialic acid is present on most cells. So uh, flu doesn't reproduce in most cells, right? So there are other things that control the reproduction of influenza virus. And that is, uh, well, for flu, it's, it's a protease that limits the ability of the virus to reproduce in other cells. The HA must be cleaved by a specific protease. And for most strains, that's only present in the respiratory tract. So that is why the virus will not reproduce everywhere, everywhere. It needs other things. Of course, for some viruses, the... Um, For some viruses, the receptor is restricted. And um, that's controlling the tropism uh, of the virus. Okay. Let's see. I'm sure you've answered this before, but can you briefly explain why it's generally recommended to get a flu shot every year, but not necessarily a COVID shot. Well, it depends who you talk to, right? Uh, the CDC recommends that certain people get both every year. So um, I, I, I don't know what you mean it's generally recommended. In the U.S., the CDC recommends that everyone... Uh, get a COVID, well, so far this year, right? Because COVID is new, right? So we don't have a policy yet. But so far they're saying this year you should get the new vaccine, the XBB vaccine, and you should also get a flu vaccine. <clears throat> I think that it makes sense if you're at risk for severe disease in particular. I've always gotten a flu shot because even if you're healthy, you know, influenza can be, not fun at all. So um, I, I always got it. And um, so that's the recommendation, really, that you, that you get both. It's not just one. Yep. Uh, is there any way to estimate how much avian influenza virus was circulating in birds prior to any of the spiller of your events that led to human epidemics? Okay, so... So we have to distinguish here. Now, there aren't any epidemics of avian influenza virus, right? Once they get into humans from birds, say. And so, so first of all, except for 1918, it's never a purely avian influenza virus that causes an outbreak. So the the, the 2009 H1N1 had a few RNAs from bird influenza viruses from pig from human influenza viruses. So it's only a subset. We do, I mean, we can't tell where they came from. I mean, there's so many birds and you can't sample all of them, right? We do a lot of bird sampling and other wildlife sampling for influenza viruses, but there's no way we can cover enough to say, aha, here's where it was just before the outbreak. So no, I mean, we can, you know, we can see what is circulating in people. There are other kinds of uh, influenza viruses, eight different HN combinations that can cause uh, outbreaks in people, but we rarely can say, here's where it came from. Very hard to do that. It's a sampling issue. Hmm.
So Rona from Basel, she says, the northern influenza was following Australia pattern. Maybe USA did in 1918, the so-called Spanish flu. How do we protect science against the anti-vaxxers? Yeah, it's a problem. They are very loud. And um, <laughs> they have, they're well-funded, so they get a lot of attention. I talked to Paul Offit today about you know, people who, who go in front of legislatures and say that vaccines make you magnetic. Why are they permitted to do this when there's no evidence for what they're saying? I mean, you know, legislatures are at fault. Politicians are at fault. Of course, they want to use it for political means. Newspapers are at fault. You know, New York Times says, oh, this person who's speaking out against vaccines is one of the uh, anti-vaccine dozen. Well, why do you have to highlight them? Why don't you highlight people who speak positively, who say good information? Why not highlight them? Because now everyone goes to look at their website, gives them a lot of traffic. And why don't you say, okay, there are lots of individuals and organizations that spread truth. Why do you highlight the naysayers? I just don't get it. So I think that's part of the problem, that people aren't critical. Legislatures let anybody come in and say, yeah, the vaccine made me magnetic. Look, I can stick this key on my forehead. It's just embarrassing. Are you serious? You look like a fool. And the newspapers don't help because they don't tell you who's doing the good job either. <clears throat> That's what I think. <laughs> Do you see bird flu killed a bunch of sea lions or seals? Yes. We had one of the scientists who studied that outbreak on a recent twiv from Baltimore. We released it last year. Bird flu, what was the name of the title? Or the title? Bird flu in Baltimore, something like that. Yeah, he talked all about it. Yeah, it's concerning because uh, th th this circulating H5, this clade, doesn't seem to pose a particular threat to people, but it's starting to wipe out populations of mammals that weren't infected before. Uh, you know, mammals like dolphins and sea lions and others. So that's, in fact, at that twiv, they said, we're worried about the mammals, not so much the people. Yep. <clears throat> I once read the manufacturer's monograph for Tamiflu. What I remember is that Tamiflu makes the course of disease half a day less, but during the period you are sick, the symptoms are worse. <coughs> Tamiflu is not great. <clears throat> you have to take it within 48 hours of symptom onset. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And the benefits are not great. Uh, apparently, excuse me, <coughs> I can mute myself. I have a mute switch now. <laughs> uh, Biloxivir is apparently much more forgiving. You can take it more days after onset of symptoms. I asked Daniel once, do you ever prescribe it? He said, no. <clears throat> Not, there's no awareness, right? <laughs> Pete says, I like the example in lecture one. What is a virus of the parasitic wasp laying eggs with a special virus in caterpillars? I use one to try and control the moths from eating all my carpets. <laughs> it's called Trichogamma evanescens, and it's barely visible to the naked eye. Interesting. I didn't know that. You could do that. <clears throat> uh, what's the meaning of PDM on the vaccine? Strategy? It just means pandemic. right? That was the 2009 H1N1, PDM H1N1. Because there's so many H1N1s, they decided to put a PDM in front of it. Um, could you say something about original antigenic sin for influenza? How does it affect e efficiency of yearly vaccines? <clears throat> so the, the er, er, original antigenic sin basically is the observation that if you get infected, your first experience with influenza virus, whether it's a vaccine or an infection, and then later you get <clears throat> infected with a related strain, 
with some antigenic cross-reactivity, you will mainly make an immune response to the original virus or vaccine. And that would be your memory response because you have memory cells to those which are activated by the cross-reactive antigen. So how does that affect uh, the yearly vaccine? <clears throat> well, it may be in part responsible for the the low efficacy of the vaccine against severe disease because, you know, it's not 60% is not great. Um, you know, and it depends on what people were first exposed to. That's the key. So if you first got flu in 1960s, uh, 68-ish, you got H3N2, so the H1N1 vaccine you get now wouldn't matter, although the H3N2 component would preferentially stimulate those, those memory cells. So I think it's a mix. I don't think it's black and white that it's not going to be good. Uh, when I started my PhD, a former lab student was one of the people with final say over the years flu vaccines. Yeah. So so Stacy Schultz Cherry at least used to be on that committee. We did a twiv with her. <clears throat> and she says it's, it's an incredibly secret process. They won't tell anyone. Uh, no, not cashmere. Black sweaters are acrylic blend of some sort. I'm not posh. I'm allergic to wool. They wash and wear well. You look pretty posh, Steph. SF. <clears throat> hmm. My sisters and I got both kinds of measles and chickenpox the same school year, missed six weeks of school. I'm sorry, they before vaccines. Hello, Levis from Colombia. Levis Marugo Castaneda. Do you remember Carlos Castaneda? The author. I used to love his books so cool <laughs> you have mentioned that there are virus sequences in the human genome that have been there for a very long time <clears throat> how do we know these are virus sequences if these are ancient parts of their gene so uh what would so they're they're, they're clearly related they're retroviruses right the sequences line up beautifully um, and I don't know, you know, they're, they predate Homo sapiens, some of them. Some of them were introduced early Homo sapiens. Some of them predate Homo sapiens and were introduced, were inherited from ancestors. But they, they have maintained a lot of homology. They haven't degraded over the hundreds of thousands of years, so we can still see they're retroviral. It's quite clear. <laughs> What are the roadblocks to having something like antibiotics for viruses? I assume those are antivirals, but why aren't those largely available for viral infections like antibiotics are? Okay, so this is this is the uh, <laughs> subject of the antivirals lecture, but let me tell you, it's not easy to make an antiviral. Our arsenal is very small, and most of them are against persistent infections like hepatitis viruses, HIV, and herpes viruses, right? Because why? Because you have a long time to treat. With an acute infection like influenza, it's like six, seven days. If you don't hit it at the right time, it's not going to work. And so we have limited numbers of antivirals. We don't have any broadly acting antivirals, although well, there are some that target DNA viruses. There are some that target RNA viruses, but they haven't been licensed. They're just not potent enough, is my understanding. So, you know, we have far more antimicrobials for sure. They're relatively easy to make compared to antivirals. And the, one of the reasons is that viruses engage a lot of host cell functions, right? They're, they're obligate in intracellular parasites. So whatever drug, often this, the, the drug that you've designed for a virus will inhibit some cell process and it's toxic, it has side effects. So much harder to make antivirals. But you saw we have a couple of antivirals rapidly made for SARS-CoV-2, so it's possible. 
Mm. I like the term therapeutic virus development rather than gain of function if virologists decide to rebrand. Well, not everything is therapeutic virus development. There are a lot of experiments that don't fall under that category and which uh, would have to be called gain of function, unfortunately. I don't know how this got so out of hand that it's so misinterpreted. It's really amazing, in fact. Look at this. Underrated channel. Absolutely. <laughs> nice, nice handle. Maybe that's why he wanted me to click on him. <clears throat> RNA viruses base may be six methylated. Yeah, so that can be a different base as well. Yep. Explain uracil. So their nucleic acids are made of four bases, AGC-T or AGCU for RNA. Uracil is one of the four bases. It's the base, which is then attached to a sugar, a ribose, and then it has three phosphates on it. So it would be uridine triphosphate. And then once the base is incorporated in DNA, it just has one phosphate. It's called uridine. So <clears throat> it's one of the four, it's one of the four building blocks of DNA. And so that's what I was talking about when I was talking about the the beaded poliovirus genome. <laughs> you want a centrifuge story. I buy table one in a box. When it's nearly empty, I take the bag out, grasp the corner opposite the spout, swing it around to drive the content to the spout. That's a centrifuge story. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> Probably better than mine, right? Hmm... <laughs> You said nobody knows why flu C is, about, is not as pathogenic, but the exciting thing about science is that somewhere someone will be the first to know. Right. The key is that you need to have a way to answer the question, right? So you can't compare C to B, in my opinion. They're very different. So what are you going to do? You could make mutations throughout the hep the um, influenza C virus genome and look for viruses with re with increased pathogenicity, say in, in mice. Um, you will get hell for doing that kind of an experiment. I guarantee it. It's a gain of function that people don't like, so maybe we shouldn't be doing that. If there were naturally occurring variants that were more pathogenic, that would be useful to study, but I'm not aware of any of those. Now, for influenza A viruses, we do have <clears throat> isolates of very similar viruses that differ in their pathogenicity, at least in the experimental animals. So you can compare those and ask, why are they different? So you see, it's not easy to do for C because we can't figure out the right experiment. Although you're right, someone's going to do it one day, for sure. <clears throat> <laughs> the vomit virus. Remember the vomit comet? I think it was that airplane that they used to put, well, probably still do, the, to simulate weightlessness. They just put it into a dive, right? <laughs> the NASA astronauts, they called it the vomit comet. Norovirus does not deserve to exist <laughs> and be gone. Well, we don't have a choice. Uh, how does polio entering the GI tract survive stomach acid? Well, the, the particle is extremely resistant to low pH and detergents and high pH, everything that it encounters throughout the tract. It's probably because the capsid is assembled in a very stable, very tight fashion. Yes. And it, there's no membrane also, which helps a lot because the membrane is trashed going through uh, the, the digestive tract. Thoughts on potential uses for AI? in virology, all kinds of uses. We use it already, really. We use computational approaches to compare sequences. We use it to look at epidemics, to do epidemiology, to do modeling, um, to solve protein structures. You know, maybe not called AI, but it's basically that. And it will just get more sophisticated. You'll be able to you know, you can look at 
patterns of gene expression and try and understand the relevance to infection. Uh, so especially big data approaches. Let's say you infect an animal and you collect many different cell types and you measure RNA sequences in them and then you put them into an AI-based program and you see what, um, what patterns emerge. Yes. A lot of I think it's unlimited. Yep. The way Vincent talks about polio versus neuro seems like he's had this kind of argument more than once. Yeah, it's not an argument. Nobody ever argued with me. I just have thought of it because I worked on polio my career, right? And I just find the neurovirus approach so unsophisticated. You know, it has... <laughs> I don't know the purpose of inducing vomiting and diarrhea, but you don't need it for spread because polio virus can spread perfectly well just by being shed in feces. Human behavior is enough. People don't wash their hands and they give their viruses to other people. You don't have to be, you know, explosive vomiting and explosive <laughs> diarrhea to spread viruses. Hmm. Uh, parasite questions, okay. I'm not a parasitologist, I guess, in the sense of, you know, the protozoan parasitologist that Dixon is. But let's see. Humans shouldn't use human feces to grow food, but would it technically be safe to grow food for animals? Is horse or cow manure safe for growing human food? Well, yeah, we, we use horse and cow manure in gardens, right? <laughs> And we, we and then you eat the, the the food that you grow, so they're fine. I don't know about giving human uh, fe using human feces to grow food for animals. I'm not sure about that. You really need to ask Dixon. It's a good question, though. Hmm. I recently got <clears throat> gastroenteritis <clears throat> and was treated with antibiotics. I was wondering how the relationship between viruses and bacteria are in the guts, why I was giving antibiotics. So most gastroenteritis is caused by viruses. It's, it, I have a pie chart in one of my lectures. Vast majority, like 75%. And it used to be thought that it was microbial, bacterial, but it's not. And so you shouldn't be given antibiotics for gastroenteritis unless they know it's Salmonella, for example, there are a number of bacteria that will cause gastroenteritis. Foodborne sources, for example, typically. Um, not always treatable, though, with antibiotics from my years on TWIM. I learned that. So it depends which one. So if they isolated, if they identified the causative agent, then that might be the reason. But if they didn't, um, I don't know. It would most likely be viral unless you, you know, had a clear food source contamination. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> Another flu highway. Pet peeve. People licking fingers to handle papers. M new business friends do this. May they tell them, I don't, shouldn't do that. I mean, yeah, you can have... You, you lick your finger and there's going to be virus there as well. And yeah, you're going to get virus on the paper. You really shouldn't do that. No, nope. no. Nope. Can influenza serve as a good viral vector? <sighs> Not really being used all that much as a virus vector. Other viruses are better for many ways. Uh, and the genome, the capacity is, is low because the segments are typically small, right? It moved to Manhattan, Kansas, Plum Island. Yep. Hello, Juliana. Juliana from Colombia also. Nice to see you. What is the particle to PFU for VSV? I don't have one for VSV. I have uh, one for... Um, for rabies, but it's bound to be different. So let's take a look at it. That would be lecture number two, and here we go. 
Let's go to the plaque assay. <laughs> okay. Mm. No, I don't even have rabies. I don't have any rhabdoviridae. But I'll tell you that papillomavirus is 10,000. Polio is 300 to 1,000. Herpes is 550 to 200. And rheovirus is 10. Influenza virus is 20 to 50. Now, I know you didn't want any of those. I don't know what VSV is. Sorry. Someone asked if, um, Daniel asks if, uh, could an mRNA vaccine for COVID be made involving one of the other 28 proteins? Nobody's going to try because the spike is clearly the target, of a main target of the immune response. I mean, some of them might contribute, but I'm, I'm not aware of any. Any others being worthwhile now? Which comes first? <laughs> Flew in the north or southern hemisphere. Do the southern make their ways? So the southern hemisphere has its winter, and then those viruses make their way up for our winter. So we monitor what's happening in the southern hemisphere. Yeah, it's kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg. Amy mentioned the BSL-3 moves to Manhattan. What protocols dictate a lab make moves like that? I, I'm not aware of what was um, involved in that move. I think they needed a more modern facility, a bigger facility, which wasn't possible on the island. And they probably looked a lot of um, at a lot of uh, different locations and settled there. I don't know the details at all. There's a lot of discussion, right? There are a lot of cattle around there. You want to bring a place that works on a cattle virus? Yep. <laughs> Rip DeCamp said, Dr. Warby's lecture, The Genesis of 1918 Spanish Influenza Pandemic, brought me to Professor Racaniello four, four years ago. Yes, that's a good lecture you can find on YouTube. Jem here from Hampton. Did Amy move to Kansas? No, <laughs> Amy is not in Kansas. Amy is at the FDA in, um, in the D.C. area. If you want to send an email to Dr. Griffin, daniel at microbe.tv. Very simple. Daniel at microbe.tv. Oh, yes, um... There's a Scottish story out about the efficacy of HPV vaccine in the Scottish population, 100% preventing uh, cervical cancer in the vaccinated versus the controls. It's a really good story. I think we're going to do that as a snippet on TWIV on Friday. The doctor from Ohio who testified during an Ohio Legislative Assembly Committee meeting who said the COVID vaccine will make one magnetic, was laughed at in Ohio. Vast majority thought she was bonkers. Very good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> but there's another story of Paul's that this is one school, some academy somewhere, would not allow vaccinated students or teachers to come to school for 30 days because someone said that you shed material that's dangerous after being vaccinated against COVID. You shed material. Didn't say what it was or how. And so they couldn't go to school for 30 days. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> Could the concept of Terminator genes... Yes, there are, and I think someone mentioned this later, gene drives which po move them move through a population, at least of hosts. You can do the same thing in viruses to cause their lack of infectivity. Yeah. Carlos Castaneda was the bomb. Yeah, Journey to Ixlan, The Teachings of Don Juan. Oh, my God, I love those books. And then after a while, they got boring. It was the same formula. But he was... 
Hey, you and I are the same vintage, huh? <laughs> yeah, gene drive. That's right. Uh, and then Raphael says, in 2021, I asked you what science had unlearned during the pandemic. You said they forgot basic science and immunology with more transmissible nonsense, et cetera. Do you think they relearned it? No, because they're still saying every freaking variant that arises, the latest one, it's going to be more transmissible. It's going to be more pathogenic. It's going to be less. They don't learn anything. They don't learn a bloody thing. I don't know why. It's been the worst experience for misinformation that I've ever have ever experienced this this pandemic. So they still don't they so who's they? They still don't understand basic science, immunology, even epidemiology. Who is that? Who are they? The whoever the press is talking to. I'm not gonna blame the press. They just propagate the nonsense. Well we'll blame them. But then they're talking to the wrong people. They that they never talk to me. Okay, fine. I don't re do research on SARS-CoV-2. So find a good virologist who does, not a pundit who never picked up a pipette in his or her life. So this is still a problem, and it remains a problem, and I don't know what's going to happen to it. Interesting that you like the Castaneda books. I wonder if you remember Phineas T. Freak. Yeah, I do, but I never, I didn't read it. Yes, AI and capsid design for gene therapy. That's very cool how they can change capsids. Yep, yep. <laughs> Human waste is a safe fertilizer if composted to get hot enough to kill pathogens. It's, okay, thank you very much. Didn't know that. If you want to ask Daniel a question, yeah, Daniel at microbe.tv, he'll answer you. Don't worry. Matt Damon did not follow proper protocol when growing those potatoes in human waste. There you go. And, you know, folks, that's it for your questions. I don't see any others. Is that true? I'm good with it. We're eight minutes from finishing anyway, so uh, we can wrap it up. I want to thank everybody for from, <laughs> from for coming tonight. I had a lot of fun. I like the mini lecture, and I think you do, and I love answering your questions. Um, Ohio Medical Board suspended the license of the Ohio doctor who stated the COVID vaccines makes one. Excellent. It's a woman doctor. Not that it matters, but just so you know. Could have been a guy as well. So just unacceptable. Magnetic. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, let me thank our moderators today. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Steph SF. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Vanity Nutrition. Who did I miss? I think I got everyone. Not a lot of uh, it, Les. I said yes. There he is, Les Frank. I did mention Frank. Thank you all for being here tonight. And, and Tom, yes, Tom, of course. Thank you all for being in here and moderating. And thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. We will be back next week, next Wednesday. The date is January 31st, the last day of January. So that same day, there's a Tweeva live stream at 1 p.m. Eastern. And then we have office hours at 8 p.m. Our guest will be Mark Martin to return and wow you with microbial centrism it's very cool in the meantime stay safe folks okay be careful and uh thank you for making as john says the brightest live audience on youtube <laughs> thank you the brightest live audience on youtube good night